Canadians are proud to select Ivan Demidov. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Curfew Boys. Tonight's host, you got me, Anxious Anthony. Wow, it's been a while. I haven't been on an episode. Happy to be back. And we got by my side, GQ Chris in the house. Hey, now. Damn, we have a lot to talk about tonight. But before we get there, if you like what you hear, you can follow the Curfew Boys on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and X. You can listen to us on any podcast platform like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google, or any other podcast platform you'd like to listen to. And also, if you're listening to this episode, you're one of our lucky fans to hear this amazing news from the Curfew Boys that will be announced very soon to the public. Uh, but to these listeners, let's say it now. The season's around the corner. We have two more exhibition games left. And then the season starts next week. And the Curfew Boys are going back to their roots. We will start doing post-game shows again starting next week. And we will get fans involved in these episodes. So stay tuned for more details. We can't wait to go back to our pretty much what made the Curfew Boys back in 2020. All those post-game shows that we used to do. Uh, we want to interact with the fans. We want to talk about every game and just, just have fun with this. So I can't wait. So stay tuned for this news on Instagram and Facebook and all our pod, all our social media platforms. But you're a lucky fan listening to this episode because you got to hear the news before everybody else. That being said, where do we start? Where do we start? So, Chris, have you been watching, um, what's it called, the, the rebuild? Absolutely. How amazing is this? This How amazing is it? I just, I just finished episode three, so I still have one more episode left. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts on just overall what you think about this whole series, but I want to get to one point to basically segue to what we're going to talk about tonight. So my opinion of the series in general, um, evidently a lot of fans are mentioning it. I, I don't think I'm the only one. I, I wish there was a little bit more on ice and between periods. Like I, I really liked, <laughs> I like the road to the winter classic John Tortorella speech it really, really, really piques my curiosity just to wonder what Marty is saying sometimes between periods. Uh, you know, imagine what what was said just in this preseason with everything that's happened. Like, what I would have done to be a fly on the wall in those moments. So, so I think that's missing a little bit. Um, however, the series on the overall, you know, I really like it. I, I've only come to like Jeff Gorton and Kent Hughes even more. Uh, you know, the Sammy's famous word, the Martyisms are, are very much present. You get to know the players a little bit more and get to see their reaction. Nick Suzuki is as uh, cool, calm, and collected and, you know, <laughs> not, not the biggest entertainer still, even when you hear him behind the scenes. But again, it just reiterates uh, what's going on in in the locker room and and just that family bond that's being built uh you know love i love to see like there's there's never enough montreal canadians content well, and even if it doesn't have as much hockey content as i would like i love it i love it can't I get could, enough of it i couldn't agree more with you i mean yes you're 100 percent right in the fact that i wish we had more like you've watched you know quarterback or receivers for the nfl and there's a lot of like in-game moments where you hear what they're saying on the bench, what they're saying on the field when it's a penalty call or whatever case may be. So I I wish we can get more of that, which you know I I assume there are going to be more episodes coming, and maybe next season we'll get more out of that. But maybe I'm being biased as a Habs fan, seeing this because it's my team. I just fucking love it because we've never got to see what's going on behind closed doors, right? Uh, I mean, over, like, I, I want to see more closed doors situations between periods, right? Uh, when Marty's getting mad or what they're saying, you know, like, for example, episode three, they were talking about the Boston game. 
where it was a really, really bad game, right? With the, it was a father son bonding game, father and son a trip, really yeah. bad game. It would have been nice to hear what Marty's saying in the dressing room. How to, how are they, how is he motivating the team to get back on the ice or things like that? It was nice to see, but overall, right now, just being biased of something new for this fan base, seeing you know, the Habs the family what they're growing, the rebuild, what they're talking about how they're getting to where they want to get to. It's just, it's really nice to see. So of course, there's a lot of uh, room for improvement and hoping that comes in later episodes or next season if they do renew to have a new season, which I think they will because I'm loving it. I'm sure a lot of fans are loving it. That being said, episode one, it starts off uh, with how last year's season started with the injuries. Right, and we've had a lot of bad luck in this in this organization with crazy injuries. I think in the last three seasons, we're just losing everybody like flies. And I know they're trying to improve that uh, in the organization to have less injuries, but we're just more and more getting these situations. New season, we're in the exhibition. We're all excited for this season to start. With the new acquisition of Patrick Liney. We're excited to see Doc again on the ice because last year he didn't have, he started off well and then we just didn't see him the rest of the season because of his injury. So we're looking forward to seeing that. And we're also looking forward to see potentially Ryan Becker making the team this year. So with all of this, us fans have been very excited for October 9th to come to see everything all together. I'm not saying this would have been the year of winning the cup. I'm not saying we would have made the playoffs. It's just, we were just excited to see all this put together, all these acquisitions and all these players coming back on the lineup, in the lineup. And guess what? You know, last year, the episode one of um, Rebuild, you, you see the reaction of Doc being injured, how it affected the dressing room. Uh, how it made so many changes for the rest of the season because, you know, they had a vision with, with Doc on the lineup and then they had to make a lot of changes, right? We're starting off the preseason well. Team is playing very well. We're winning games, playing well together. And then a few nights ago, boom, something we did not want to see. Ryan Becker getting hurt and leaving the ice. And then you see Patrick Liney getting hit and leaving the ice. I will speak on behalf of all Habs fans. That night really stinged everybody. Sting me. I was freaking out. I think I watched that replay a thousand times. Trying to see what happened. Could have been prevented. Was it part of the game? Is it not part of the game? Just all these thoughts coming in your mind. We're yelling at the TV. I'm yelling at my phone. We're yelling at each other on our group chat. <laughs> you know, so angry that this happened. And then, of course, us typical Haas fans, ah, oh, the season is over. They didn't even start yet. It's over. Oh, this is going out, Joe. Let's wait for 20. Is 2026 here yet? All that, all those stuff coming, right? Um, let's fast forward to a couple of days later. I think. Actually, before we get there, let's let's talk about that night. Let's talk about your reaction. What did you feel that night exactly? Let's share that with your with the fans. And also, what did you think of that? Let's talk specifically Liney first. I think that was major. I know the Ryan backer was, you know, an unfortunate moment. Uh, something that couldn't couldn't have been prevented. Um, but let's just go Liney because that again, big acquisition. All the money we spent on having this guy on our team, hoping that he's make a big comeback in the NHL with our team to make to improve this organization. And then come Saturday night, we just thought that we lost this player for good. So uh, if if you'll allow me, yeah. I'd like to take a moment to maybe to get you into the context of how I'm feeling. Uh, since Saturday well, night, so Saturday feeling. night, I, I actually headed over to from you. I know exactly how you're feeling now. Let's see how you uh, express it here on 
live recording. <laughs> Fuck. I, I've been begging to do this episode for a few days now. I've been thinking about what I want to say and how I want to say it. And, you know, now that I'm here, I'm, I can't even, I, it feels like I can't put the words together, but just on the emotional and mental side, Saturday night, I was actually over at Sammy's place with Sammy and his girlfriend, uh, uh, went over with my girlfriend and going to have supper. And I remember walking in and saying, I am so excited for this game. It was the closest, it was the closest look, uh, that we got to what I expected the team to look like for his game of the season against Toronto, October 9th. I'm telling you, like, I, I was excited. I was genuinely, I walked in. I'm not a very, I'm not a very, like, I don't, I don't tend to show my emotion too, too much for many things. Uh, literally, apparently I'm doing a good job. My boss wanted to offer me, uh, offered me something very, very nice today. And I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Like, thank you. Thank you very much. Please don't read too much into my reaction because I'm just, yeah, I was like, oh, I'm tired. I'm whatever. So just don't react to too much, but went in there. I was excited and I was showing it. And what came out of that game, obviously, like you said, Reinbacker, um, you said it so well, we'll come back to it. But with Line, I can genuinely say with the fan base, with the other individuals who are doing podcasts and posting Habs content, with the media members here in Montreal, with the team itself, there was a buzz in the city. There was an excitement. There was so much. There was a sentiment that there was so much to look forward to. And because of that stupid fucking play that led to the injury, I am telling you, I feel as a city, as a fan base, like I just feel so deflated. I am down. I've been down for the past few days and I know it's hockey. There are things that are more important in life than hockey, but it felt like the first time in a while it was just like, no, this can't continue. There can't be more injuries. It's not going to happen again. Everything is like, everything is turning up. I'm the first to say the stars are lining. The stars are lining all the time. I'm repeating it like a broken record and holy crap. That was a kick in the teeth type of night with what happened. So emotionally, that's how I'm feeling. I've, I felt like I've been getting dragged through the mud. I feel as a fan base that we've been getting dragged through the mud for the past few days. And it's been carrying over into my personal life. Like I've, I've actually had a hard time dividing hockey from personal life. It's, it's been an unprofessional or, or even not none. Like it's just not been good for the past few days because of, because of this sounds childish, sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling the truth. This is how I feel. I feel deflated along with a whole lot of you. Now, what is my reaction to the actual play itself? <laughs> you know, Leafs, that, like Leafs fans and everybody. I'll, I'll start. I'll, I'm, I'm before you jump in, Anthony. I'll say this much. Cedric Pare could have decked. Could have absolutely laid in with his shoulders, could have clotheslined Liney, took out his front two teeth. He decided to go forward with his fucking knee first. You, there's no convincing me. There's no convincing me that it was not the knee first. It was a dangerous play in a game that didn't count for anything, and it was knee first. Yeah, now we got a we got a we got a potential superstar players because now now it's the argument. Well, he's not a superstar player. He hasn't. He's a fucking potential superstar player who's already scored over forty goals. Please, please refrain from using that any any sort of argument as such. That was a dangerous play, unnecessary. He's getting blamed for trying to cut between two guys. Excuse me. That's what hockey is. Forcing the play, charging forward. That's what skilled players are. We're gonna start saying, uh, Kale McCarr, don't try to don't try to perform any deeks on the back end. Uh, Nathan McKinnon, don't try to perform any deeks. Um, Connor McDavid, stop deking. Uh, stop trying to go between two or three guys at, at the same time because it's that it's your fault. It's also your fault because you have your your wide stance. If you look, there's a clear change of direction of the player's knee. And again, if he would have clotheslined him. Of course, Habs fans would have been pissed. Of course, it would have been a dirty play. But there's a difference between a dirty play and a dangerous play. And mm -hmm. now we have a player who's sidelined for two to three months. And two to three months, believe it or not, fans, is good news as compared to what we were expecting. Dangerous play, fucking boneheaded play in a game that didn't count for anything. And, and you know what? Let me toss it back to you. 
these fucking preseason games, there's so many players from the opposing team who don't even deserve to be on the same ice surface as some of these AHL scrubs. And even if they're lucky enough to be considered AHL scrubs for life. So that that's my initial reaction. I'm sorry, Anthony. No, no, no. Just no. outboard. No, no, no. And and you know what? I, I can't even beat what you just said because it's a, it's exactly – look, let's just rewind to how you felt in the last couple of days. You said it was silly or whatever. Look, I'm not going to lie. I felt the same way. And coming from me, who really takes – who's very emotional when it comes to sports, too emotional at times, to the point where it takes over my personal life my whole entire life, you know, like – I went days when the Habs lost or my Patriots lose or when Italy loses, I don't talk to anybody for a week. And people used to like make fun of me about it. Like, oh my God, you know, these guys are already on the golf course laughing and you're home crying about it. Well, you know what? I'm very passionate when it comes to sports. Now, I did lose that passion. I've said this many times in this podcast the last four years. I did lose a lot of my passion with the Montreal Canadiens, NHL as a whole uh, for the last couple of years. But it was slowly coming back. And the last two seasons with the whole rebuild situation and Marty and Gordon and all and Hughes and the players and the way they're building this team, my passion was coming back. And you said it right. There was a buzz in the city this year. Okay. And we've said this many times. Finally, this fan base were not, um, our expectations are not high yet for winning now. We finally established and came to an agreement and saying, you know, like when, 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 uh, what's his name? Um, Benjamin was giving us the five-year plan and every year, oh, we're going to win this year. And then we would the lose and, get mad and all that stuff. We always had hope that we're going to win, win, win. And we never won. Right. And we all knew, especially, you know, fans, the realists like Joey, who says, you know, we're not going to win anytime soon, guys. Stop with these little fixing these potholes and little, finally, this fan base understands that we need to be patient a little longer. We're not going to win anytime soon. It's going to take a couple more years. Just be patient and just be excited for this journey. We all finally came to that agreement and we're just having fun watching this team. That being said, this year with the acquisitions and all these potential players, um, sorry, let me rephrase that, all our you know, players like the Ghoulies and the Mayus, all these guys who are coming up to finally make this team, our future superstars are finally ready to play. There is a buzz in this city. And then when you add in Patrick Liney into the lineup, the, the, the buzz just exploded. We're all fucking excited. And finally, not excited to say we're winning this year, just excited to see this team get on the ice, play, and, you know, Potentially contend. Beat, score some goals, be entertaining, not be a defensive roster for the first time in 20 years. Exactly. And finally see this team that we've been trying that this team has been trying to build kind of mesh together finally, right? Because the first year, two years ago, we we're like, okay, you know, these guys are young, they don't know how to play, there's no chemistry. And then last year the chemistry was building, and then we have Lane Hudson who finally made the team, and then you're seeing him how he's playing this year. So far, it's like, oh my god, this guy's a superstar. And again. The buzz was there. We couldn't wait for October 9th to come to just start this season. So I, and then now, like I said before, my passion finally came back. So a year ago or two years ago, I couldn't care less if someone got injured or whatever. I would just go on with my day to day. You know, it wasn't in my norm to be that type of fan because I used to take it to heart. Saturday night was my 11th year anniversary, wedding anniversary with my wife. We're out for dinner. Thank you. Um, we're having dinner. Beautiful dinner. No kids. We're enjoying our anniversary. And I get this text message in our group chat. And a friend of mine messaged me that Biden is out. And I watched the video in front of my wife. Um, and I saw this crazy ass dangerous play. And I lost it. I lost it. It really took over my night. I'm it's you said it before. It might sound silly and stupid. And there's some listeners out there listening to this and say, oh, you fucking idiot. You're with your wife and you care about uh, Liney who's making $9 million. And he's probably fucking, you know, 
home right now doing nothing and you're just complaining instead of being with your wife. No, it took over me because like I said, you said it before, exact words. I felt deflated at that moment because everything we've been waiting and excited to see in the next couple of days just went in the fucking shithole. Like it just, it just died. So it took over. But then when you watch that replay over and over again, and then there's some people saying, oh, it's part of the game. It's part of the game. Fair. It is part of the game, the speed and go, and what, what, what Liney did going in through the players. I get it. It could be dangerous. But like you said before, if the guy would have just hit him shoulder to shoulder or, you know, smashed into him and he loses his two front teeth, fine. Then you could say it was Liney's fault. He shouldn't have done that. Or he took a risk. That's a fair point. But when you see a player like, I don't even fucking know his, you know, I don't even know who this guy is. Okay. I'm being sarcastic. But, and then he goes and pulled his knee out first. Watch that replay over and over again. That knee went out first. That was unnecessary. Unnecessary. You can point fingers at Liney for taking that risk. Fair. But he put his knee out. And that is to me, very dangerous, unnecessary, especially for a stupid exhibition game. That being said, this league has to wake up. Here they are trying to prevent fighting, to you know have less injuries and less fights on the ice and concussions and this and that. But yet you're still risking the players to add these stupidity games that are not necessary. I get it. Exhibition is important. We need it to you know, test out the rookies and the rookie camp and all that crap. I get that. But I think it's time to wake up and shorten it because all these players who are risking themselves against, like you said before, players that don't deserve to be on the ice. These are players that are going to be in the H AHL or maybe never making the NHL. And you're putting them on the ice with players like Crosby, McDavid, you know. No, you're, you're, you're risking these superstars against players that don't even deserve to be there. They don't even know the game yet. They have no experience in the NHL. And you're putting them on the ice with superstars that you're risking their career because they are they don't know how to – like this guy, Cedric, he probably just wasn't mature enough to play the game. And and and, and, and you, know what I mean? you know what I'm trying to say? So the NFL woke up not long – a few years back, and they shortened this the preseason games – because they saw how many injuries it was causing for games that are not important. There's a difference between playoff hockey, season hockey, and preseason. And now you're seeing these players play exhibition games as if it's the fucking Stanley Cup Finals. It's it's not a, it, anyways. You're you're also putting okay. on a bunch of players who are trying to make a name for themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, even even Arbor Jack, I who can't wait to talk about our friend Arbor, our my, my favorite player on the team, Arbor. But uh, you know, Arbor had said it himself. Like a lot of the a lot of the players are going to go and try to play a very physical game. We're going to try to drop the gloves. Are going to do something to stand out. I get and, it. I get you know, it. Physical is going to be one of the easiest things to do. Uh, you can't ask everybody to dangle through the whole team and score a goal, but you can definitely, uh, you can definitely ask a guy to play physically. Shame on Craig Berube, by the way. Uh, I, there's some people are saying it's in response to Pizzetta hitting, uh, hitting uh, John Tavares, and whatever. But they brought up they brought a lineup of thugs, of thugs, and and you know what? I'm also gonna make. This is, I don't want to go there, but this might also be even a coaching point for Marty as a coach. Get get ready to deal with this type of shit and look out in protecting your players, especially in games that don't count. But uh, again, man, if, if, if we go back just to the play, there are a million and one different things. And, and like I said, even... As, as crazy as this sounds, I don't want to start getting into brain injuries versus knee injuries, but had Patrick Laine, like, and I'll be the first to say, had Patrick Laine skated in with his head down and tried to dangle between two players since the times of Scott Stevens, if you're going to go in with your head down, that's on you. That's mm -hmm. a risk you're taking. And if 
Line A got lit up and hit with a hard shoulder check. That's on him. Down, that's on Line well, he's the First to say, as a Haas fan, yes, he got injured. Uh, it sucks. The but the buzz would have been, you know, like I said before, would have been, felt the same emotions of like, oh, we lost a superstar and whatever. But I would look at the replay and say, well, that's on you, right? Look, last week or two weeks ago, again, really off topic, but very similar situation. You know, uh, Tua, a quarterback from Miami. Okay, three concussions. He just got his fourth. The way he got it in the game, it sucks. Let's say I was a Miami fan and say, fuck, I just lost my quarterback. We have a super, an amazing team, and we just lost our superstar. But then you watch the replay and say, what the fuck? That's your fault. That was his fault. The way he did it, he shouldn't have – He basically, just to give some context, he ran, and when he got the first down, there was a player coming. Instead of sliding like every other quarterback should be doing, he went head first into the player and he's got another concussion, which could be career ending by the way. Um, but again, a smart player should have slid. Every quarterback slides when they're running and they hit the first down, they just slide when they see a player coming in to protect themselves. He did not protect themselves. He went head first. Now let's say I was a Miami fan. I'd say, fuck, I just lost my star player, but Hey, guess what? It was his fucking fault. He's a fucking idiot. That's what I would say. Same thing with Liney. If he would have got hit because his head was down and he got smashed like a Scott Stevens hit, then I'd say, you know what? It sucks that Liney is out, but guess what? It was your fault. You should have been smarter than that. But this specific play, it, what? again, he risked it. It's part of the game. He went to two guys. He shouldn't have done that. He should have been a, bit, a little bit more smarter, but it doesn't matter. He did what he did. It's a fast game. He was trying to make a move. But the action of Cedric to put his knee out first was not necessary. And there is that's my point. That's your point. That's everybody else's point. Everybody should look at this play over and over again and say, that's the reason why he got hurt. He shouldn't, that guy shouldn't have put his knee out. It was a dangerous, dirty play. Simple as that. Now, yeah, exactly that. I think we I could I think we could leave it at that. And it and it leads just to a natural conversation as to what happens thereafter can 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 i can i start by yeah but before we, get to that, I'm, I'm, before we get to that i just want to say as a to all our house fans today was the best news we could have gotten for this situation okay so we could just close this off by the patrick line injury today was announced that i mean look between me and you watching that play over and over again i thought this guy was either gone for the season or probably done for his career the knee looked like it would fucking turn 360. I don't know that. Looking at that replay over and over again, I thought this guy was losing his leg. You know what I mean? I know I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's how bad it looked. But for them to announce today that it was just a sprain and he's out for two to three months, guys, all have fans out there, this is the best news you could hear from a situation like that. Because now... The excitement is still there. Why? Because I don't think, yes, Liney is an, a big impact to the team, 100%, but we still have a good team that can give us two good months of hockey. And then when Liney comes in, he can spark up whatever they, they – if the team, again, starts off well and they show us their potential, and then you bring in Liney in December to spark up what they started – that's how more excited we would all be watching this you know guy. What, Anthony, you just made me realize that I got a little bit ahead of myself because I really want to address one of the things that was uh, that was shared by Marty St. Louis in uh, after in and after practice. So Marty had one of his best quotes, and just again so reassuring as to the direction of this organization. Wow. He said two things. It was our job to get Patrick to like coming and enjoy coming to the rink again. And we did that. And uh, Marty said that with a little glaze in his eye, a little, uh, little motion uh, behind those eyes. And the way he was talking, I swear to you, 
I swear to you, I thought it was I thought it was done for the season. So yes, it was out. It's outstanding news. Number one, that he doesn't have to go under the knife. There's no surgery required. He's it's a sprain. Thank God for his long moose legs <laughs> that that don't, did not fall apart. Even even given the bend that uh, that was seen time and time again. So that's one. But Marty also said, you know. We're, we're, it's not just a house that we have here. Like the organization in metaphoric terms is not just a house. We're trying to build a home and we really like, we really are on the right path. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Why, I'm not saying exactly he, that. He also said that it's, it's stinged even harder because they're not just building a house, they're building a home. And I'll just quote you that word for word. Not exactly that, but he said something else about Liney. The number one job we had to do with Patty was make him excited to come to the rink. And he was hearing that from your coach. Like uh, just give me goosebumps. Like this team, this organization is bringing this team and organization to the right path of glory. I'm sorry to say that. I know I'm over ahead of ourselves, but just hearing the coach talk the way he talks about his players. It's like a family. It's not just business. It's also a family. As no, I said it. It, it, was a family. A, it was a quote. It was a quote, like you said, that is moving. It, it gives, gives you, you, it gives you chills. It's, it's so reassuring. And, and what was so hard, like to tie it all in and to wrap up, I guess, on Patrick line and, and talk about what ensued thereafter. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest, one of the big elements to it feeling so, def like, to the fan base feeling so deflated was just, again, it was a feel good story. It was a guy, like, a guy starting a charitable uh, organization to, to assist people who have, you know, who have different, like, challenges and, and need to reach out for help. Like, it was just all around. It was a fresh beginning, a new start, a guy coming in with, like, a rejuvenated guy coming in with all sorts of positivity, looking to contribute to, you know, hopefully a nice story. And, and again, robbed of that. Like, completely tarnished by such a fucking stupid play. And that was, that was, and you know what? Leafs fans celebrate, celebrate all you fucking want uh, about, you know, having our fan base feel deflated go go right on ahead karma's a fucking bitch if there's anything that uh, like that life has shown time and time again with the range of people that have ever come into contact with karma's a bitch and 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 we'll see we'll see what happens i'm not talking about I'm not talking about vengeance i'm just talking about karma what goes around tends to come around naturally yeah. not with any negative incentive Let's like talk negative about intention happened. behind it now sorry i cut you off before i want you to continue to talk about what happened, the after effect of that hit. What happened? What did you see? And why do we love this team so much after this specific moment? Finally. So um, I might even have a few complaints for certain individuals on the team, but let me let me emphasize this to, to set the scene once again. When the refs don't do the job, the players have to do the policing. Even tonight. Montreal Canadiens just played the Ottawa Senators. We're, we're having this discussion post-game after another shit show and another instance where the refs are not doing their job. And what ends up happening? A, a hero of a man. I don't give a shit what people are saying. He jumped a player. He did this and that. Arbor Jackeye. Arbor Jackeye. We, we, we mentioned this just not even two months ago. When Patch Reddy almost had his head detached from his shoulders... From a hit from Chara, we had Scott Gomez skate up to him and poke him with his stick and say, that's not very nice what you did right there. My player is almost dead on the... But that's that's not very nice, Mr. Zdeno Chara. That's not very nice. Arbor Jackeye is the first Montreal Canadiens player for as long as I can remember. Maybe, maybe going back to a player like Sheldon Surrey who had a mean streak when it counted. But Arbor Jackeye is the first player that took the shit into his own hands and sent a clear message that if you touch our players, and especially if you want to turtle and not fight, you're still not walking out with just a, oh, it's okay, you don't want to fight. He beat down on a player. He punched him to the back of the head. He did something that was dirty in response to something that was even dirtier. And you know what? Like, seriously? 
hats off to Arbor because I have been dying to see a player of his sort that will genuinely make you pay for stupidity. I sent you guys an analogy. I, I may, I, you know what? I'm going to skip that all around, but it's kind of like Joe Pesci in Casino when he says, I'm willing, like, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that's gonna hospitalize you, and then right when right when you're gonna be getting out of the hospital and I'm gonna be coming out of jail, I'm gonna do it again because I'm stupid like that. And Arbor has like, and I like using that example because what Arbor did was stupid. He put the like in a certain sense seven minutes of penalties after doing what he did to uh, Cedric Paré, and again tonight he he nailed Stutzle. We'll get into the Stutzle I think. He did these. I couldn't give a shit. I couldn't give a shit about the repercussions. I couldn't give a shit about the penalty kill that they have to that, that they have to. I don't I don't I don't care if they end up losing. There's one clear message that comes out of Arbor Jack Eye's actions. It's that if you are gonna do something stupid, I'm gonna do something equally as stupid, and you're going and so, and you are going to pay for what you do. It's it's I'm sorry to say, I'm again not the promotion of violence, it's just Simply, so, factually speaking, it's an eye for an eye. And the Montreal Canadiens have been beaten down and they've been run through and they've been injured time and time again. And Arbor Jack is the first one to say, no matter the cost, no matter what it does, that player or that grouping of players is going to pay the price for their reckless stupidity that leads to my brothers being injured. Point à la ligne. Now, Thank you, Arbor. Keep up the great work. We're going to get into what you did tonight uh, against Ottawa. No problems with that either. The only thing I want to say about that, so I'll play that devil's advocate. So not that I'm going against you, Chris. Um, look, I agree with you, what you said before, that finally, ever since I, ever since I can remember, we finally have a player that stands up that stands up for our teammates, for our brothers, the way he does. It sends a message to the league where, hey, you're not fucking around with my guys, okay? And we finally, we've always needed that, and we finally have it. I think every team should have that one player on the team to show everybody else around the league you're not messing with our guys, okay? It's very important because, like you said, we got stepped around for many years, right? That whole chara hit to patch ready, and then we went and <laughs> don't do that. That nice, like no, it, 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 we're not gonna play nice, okay? So people took advantage of that because it was easy to hit one of our guys or hurt one of our guys, and basically just get a slap on the wrist after that. Now the league knows that we have a player like Jack Eye, where hey, you touch one of my guys, you're fucking done. That being said, I don't want to promote violence. I don't want to promote revenge. So what I'm trying to say is that Jack Eye needs to find a balance. Okay? Because what he's doing, though it's the right thing to do in the sense of how we feel as house fans we're being biased, like, fuck, our guy just got hurt. Let's go attack. But then it fucks us after. Right? We get that seven-minute power. I, 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 it was stupid and it was excessive. But, but, yeah, but it was genuinely like it's. But the smart thing to do is if Jack, I could find that balance. So what I'm trying to say is that yes, we have a guy who's going to scare the league, right? And people are going to be scared to touch one of our guys. But some smart teams will say, "Well, you know what? Let me let me poke the bear because if I poke him." The team is going to get a 7 to 8 or 10 minute penalty where we'll have a nice big power play to try to win the game. So people might take advantage of that, right? What I'm yes. trying to say. And then potentially our player gets fined, which he already has. And then potentially a suspension where he won't be there for 5, 6 games. So those 5, 6 games that he's gone, the teams will take advantage and say, hey, Jack is not there. Let's, let's, let's act on it, right? So what I'm trying to say is that if Jack I can find the balance where he doesn't get excessive, but still shows the league, hey, don't fuck around, then that's where we play it smart. 
have a player like Jack Eye who will stand up for his guys, find that balance where he might just get that two-minute penalty or maybe no penalty whatsoever because it's okay to fight back. It might be a double penalty where you know both players go in the in the, the penalty box. So what I'm trying to say is that I think Jack Eye just needs to mature himself. He's still a young player in the league. He's acting out of anger, which I get it. I'm giving him full credit for what he did on Saturday because I'm sorry he hurt one of your superstars. But when I'm trying to say Jack Eye just needs to mature himself a little more, find that balance of being excessive and being too weak, find that middle ground because there's a lot of players in the league that had that middle ground that players were scared of and, you know, did not take advantage of these moments because if Jack Eye continues doing what he's doing, it's going to lead to, like I said before, I know I'm repeating myself, and I'll say it one more time to conclude it. If Jack Eye continues being as excessive as he is, it's going to lead to a lot of penalties where other teams will take advantage of that and win games. Two, suspensions where we're going to be missing him in the lineup for five, six games, where the league will take advantage in those five, six games to hurt our players because there's no one there to defend them. All I'm saying is that be smart, Jack Guy. Continue what you're doing in the sense that defend the boys, defend your brothers, because we finally have that guy in our team. Just do it smart. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, and I'll, I'll say this much. <laughs> Considering that there's no points, there are no points behind these games, there's no two points at stake, and that Arbor was responding to reckless plays. And again, it's a perfect time to kind of graduate yeah. into what happened to, uh, tonight. So Riley Grieg decides to perform a late blindside hit against Kirby Doc. Could have been very dangerous, could have fallen on the ice, could have hit his head, uh, already kind of had a whiplash to his head. Thank God he came back. What happens? Michael Pizzetta goes and challenges uh, Riley Grieg. No, doesn't respond, doesn't do anything. I don't know if you saw, I don't know if you saw the Jake Evans interview with RDS after the first period. He basically said, stupid, useless hit. Uh, he doesn't want to respond for it uh, to, uh, or for his actions. Now watch the game get out of hand. We're not going to be walked on. We're going to, I'm, I'm paraphrasing yeah. again. I don't have it, but Jake Evans basically called the fact that it was going to get violent. Who was our best player? Who like genuinely, who was our best player on the Montreal Canadiens tonight? It was Kirby doc. Uh, Tim Stutzle is arguably one of the best, if not the best player on the Ottawa senators. And what ends up happening almost like a picture perfect replica of the angle and the type of hit. The only thing is that Arbor, and look at this carefully before you start attacking. Arbor actually hit Stutzley's stick into his own face. It was Stutzley's stick that got him to to shoot his head back. It wasn't even. It wasn't even. Oh, okay, he threw up his elbow. Whatever that came after. That came after the hit. Uh, just but but again, if you are not answering the bell, and it wasn't even Arbor who went to go knock. It was a guy within his own weight class, similar. Michael Pizzetta went after him, didn't want to respond, said, you know what? This game's going to get stupid. This game's going to get out of hand. And guess what? A star player, I'm not condoning Arbor taking off a star player's head. But again, it's just an example of mm. Arbor Jack by saying, this is an eye for an eye. Mm. You're going after our best player? We're going to go after your best player. Struble did a little bit of a better job. He absolutely decked Riley Grieg, uh, Grieg with, a, with a clean hit coming to the zone. Brutal hit. Loved it. But Arbor Jack, I like, again, hats off to him. I don't care that he got a game misconduct and it was a five minute penalty. Uh, I, I, I really wholeheartedly and genuinely don't give a royal shit that he got kicked out of the game. It was a message, it was a clear message. And the message that's coming out of it is if you are going to take the risk of injuring one of our players, then expect expect somebody to be injured. 
again, it's an eye, it's an eye for an eye. It's not condoning violence. It's not promoting violence. It's not saying it's just the way he's reacting. The way he's reacting is showing me in, in a metaphoric term or, or manner, an eye for an eye. And if it's going to be an eye for an eye, let me tell you, there will be hard hits. There will be players who are going to be laid out. But if I'm the Ottawa Senators and the Maple Leafs, what I am thinking the next time around is, number one, I better answer the bell. Because it could have been it could have been Michael Pizzetta. Like, think about it. It could have been Michael Pizzetta landing a few hits. Riley Greig ended up fighting Kirby Doc. Hats off to Kirby Doc for, for sticking up to that stupid piece of shit. But, but furthermore, had he just answered the bell, to Michael Pezzetta, a lot smaller and a lot less mean than Arbor Jack Eye would have been over, would have been done with, would have been out of the way. No, nope. instead, game gets out of hand. And Riley Grieg, you put your player at risk because you have a wild dog on the Montreal Canadian side. And thanks to this wild dog who's unpredictable and who's going to do some crazy shit, you're running the risk of injuring one of your star players. And the next time that you play us, you better think twice about running us. Point à la ligne and, once and again. And that's the message that I want to continue promoting from our team and our players. You know, don't fuck around. 100% in full agreement with you, uh, Chris. And the, jo- the the refs have to do a better job. Like you said before, if the refs are not going to do the job, well, then you're going to get, you know, if the uh, league thank wants you. to... And the league... Yeah. You know, no fighting, no injuries, no this, but yet you have super refs on the on the ice, not calling these dangerous moments. So it's only normal we're gonna take matters in our own hands. All I'm saying, again, not disagreeing with anything you said, Chris. I I fully, again, being a biased has fan here with all the anger I have in me of going and attack our, our superstars. You want to talk the emotion side of me? Fuck yeah, Jack guy. Go fucking destroy this guy. Go do what you got to do. Keep those gloves on and destroy him. That's the anger side of me. But then, you know, the other side of me where, you know, when you calm down your, your emotions and your, your nerves and anger, all I'm saying is try to find to do this in a smarter way because there yeah. is a smarter way of doing it. I'm not saying not, not to be a little, you know, like let yeah, it go, don't. you know? Yeah. I'm saying still do what you got to do. Just do it in a way where it doesn't lead to a misconduct or a 10-minute penalty. Because there is a way of doing it to just get a five-minute major or a two-minute penalty. That's fine. But don't risk your the game of, you know, a play like that can cost us a game, right? That's all I'm saying. There's two things that I want to go back on. And then we could, we could come close to wrapping. But if the refs have just tossed both 100%. Cedric Paris. And they would have tossed Riley Grieg tonight. Done. Done. Refs. No, but I'm not it's, but, it, but it, hold it, on. It, it, I'm not saying that Jack I should not drop the gloves or do what he has to do. Even if the refs do, do their job, we still have to act on, on that to show the other team, the other the, the, the rest yeah. of the league that don't fuck around. I'm not I'm not saying I don't want Jack I to do what he has to do. Do your job and fucking fight these guys. Hundred percent scare the league that you touch me you're get you, you touch one of my guys you're done keep that when i'm trying i think i'm not saying it right i don't know if I'm, I'm i'm explaining it right what i mean by being smart i'm not saying being smart means let it go and walk away i'm saying being smart like for example on thir- on saturday when jack guy went to attack okay he still had his gloves on and he got him by the back that is so- stupidity so I, I think fully, you know, I can understand why he did that anger, uh, a lot of emotions going and attack one of our superstars. I understand that. That's the non-smart way. The smart way is you go grab the guy, you drop your gloves, and then you attack. Because that doing it that way, you don't get the major. You don't get that seven-minute penalty. You You'll get, get the instigator, but you the instigator is well worth it. And 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 but I want to. I think I have the words that you were looking for. Don't be excessive in your actions. But I also do want to. There was the other. There's the other thing too, or the, the two other points. Going back to the refs. Okay, I'm going to have a third point. I have a bone to pick. The refs should have tossed both of the players, both the both Cedric Paré and then tonight Riley Grieg. They should have both been tossed. Again, game counts for nothing. There's no two points. Don't let it escalate. Get that shit out of the game. 
Get it out of the game. There's going to be high emotions instead. No penalty on the first one, on the brutal one where we saw Line go down and not be able to freaking get up himself off the ice. And then the next one, again, the next freaking game, uh, uh, what looks what looks like a headshot, they go and they take, no, instead, just get it out of the game. Don't let it escalate. That's one. Point number two is that Arbor, uh, I can't throw you enough flowers, man, but it's not only up to Arbor. On on it's the Saturday else. night game, what? Why is Josh Anderson waiting? Why is he waiting? Fuck! I know it all happened very fast, but like at the at the same time, we want again. It's easy to say. I'm not on the ice. I'm not playing. But I wish, I wish, or at least I hope to know deep down that Josh Anderson didn't see. He had no idea what was going on, and he went to go check. But honestly, even if I'm a player and I look up at the jumbotron and I see that happen, if I'm Josh Anderson, I'm running up, I'm running up to Cedric Paré and I'm dropping the gloves à l'instant, the moment that I see that, yeah. because it's not only Arbor's job to answer, and it's not only Michael Pazetta's job either. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's the other point. And then again, as for as for the gloves on, to go back to what Arbor did to Cedric Paré and he beat him down with the gloves. Arbor chased him around for a solid like 10 strides. He slashed him in the back. He grabbed onto him. And he grabbed onto him a second time. He's he's clearly talking to him. And he is run the players running, ducking, avoiding, as though as though he like all he's trying to do is avoid contact and pretend Arbor's non-existent. Arbor was seeing red. Arbor, Arbor saw nothing, but my brother went down. It was a dirty play. You're done. But but he gave him don't 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 start with this yeah at the end of the day he jumped him but he had ample amount of time to turn around and to answer as a man but he didn't so what like i i love the i love the question i was asked what was arbor supposed to do what's he supposed to do and 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 that's why i said i like the fact that arbor doesn't walk the line arbor crosses the line when it calls for it and, and again, I'm agree in agreement. We yeah. we shouldn't he should we shouldn't be calling for excessive force and excessive reaction that's going to lead us to punishment and penalties and suspensions. Like Arbor does have to smarten up and be more balanced. That's, that's, but that's, under those yeah. circumstances, thank God he crossed the line oh, because he's the first why. player to actually do like he did what he had to be done. And he got his I'm hand dirty and he fucking did something that was dirty. But the message was sent. Yes, and 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 that's where I agree with you, and that's why I'm saying. Speaking about Saturday, I'm full hands gonna fucking send a bouquet to Arbor to do, you know, doing what he did because the refs didn't do what they had to do. It had to take Jack Eyed across the line again for a game that was not important and a play that was not necessary for a game that meant nothing. And you know what, Jack Guy? Hats off to what you did because what he did was, you know, perfect. Sending a message to the league, don't fuck around. For a game that was not important, there was no points on the line. What are they got a three thousand dollar fine? What the fuck is three thousand dollars for the guy? You know, and the refs didn't do anything. So you know what? Hats off. I'm just saying down the line, find a way to smarten yeah. up. Find that balance. Again, I'm not saying to walk and just shake his hand and say, hey, don't do that. I'm saying I'm saying I want Jack I to continue being the guy he is. We need that. We've been missing that for a long time. I want the league to be scared of us. I don't want anybody to walk over us anymore. I don't want anybody to hurt us anymore. I don't want anybody to fucking take us as little fucking young kids playing novice hockey. We're a team of brothers. Like, like Marty said, where uh, this is a they're building a not building just a house. They're building a home. They're building a family. They're building a bond. Every player in that room is brothers. Okay, they're family. They're all blood. So don't fuck around with blood. That's all. And I and I want every single player to defend each other. Not just Arbor, like you said. It can't just be one guy. It can't be just the enforcers like Pizzetta. I want everybody. To be able to fight because the league, if it's just only one guy, then hey, let's find a way to 
not have this guy on the ice. But if it's Anderson that drops the gloves or Gallagher, look, Gallagher's career is coming to an end. Okay, he has nothing to prove anymore. So he has, I'm not saying to be an enforcer, Gallagher. All I'm saying is that you have that nitty gritty style of hockey. Well, why don't you use that with defending your guys? And I I know we try to keep this as a short episode. There was okay, evidently no human way possible that we it's keep this episode that short. Injury, but, yeah. but there's one. We got to the point of, thank you for bringing that up, because we got to a huge, we skipped over a huge point. And I think it's something that has to absolutely be mentioned, talking about dropping gloves. Kirby Doc did it tonight after just the stupidity of, of Riley Greig continuously diving and hitting high and all that. Kirby Doc, again, amazing. So proud to see it. But Saturday night, Uri Slavkovsky drops the gloves with a no name. And people are laughing. People are saying, oh, Slavkovsky got one punch. I, I don't know. He got up pretty quickly. The The Maple Leafs player was pretty cut up in comparison. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, there's such a thing as losing balance. That's that's one. But let me go a step further. Uri Slavkovsky, a first overall pick, dropping the gloves at, when emotions run high. I, I couldn't, like, obviously, I don't want to see him getting hurt. That's a That's kind of a stupid decision. Like, logically speaking... It's a stupid decision that he took to fight a no-named, useless scrub of a of a player in comparison. But Uri Slavkovsky, that's a huge message to your team of, I'm one of your brothers. I'm a big boy. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm not a I'm not a princess. And for all, I, I'm telling you like this, even if he loses. And you have other teams celebrating, whether it's the Toronto fans, the Boston fans, the Ottawa fans, the Philly fans celebrating and saying slaps a bust first off, start watching hockey. But number two, especially, especially for a team like Toronto, that is the difference between why we win in the playoffs and why you guys are perennial losers. When you see Austin Matthews getting ragdolled, Back when, back when you were up 3-1, by the way, and you were getting ragdolled and you thought it was so funny to smile behind your mustache, behind the net, because you were so tough and you were winning the series. That's the type of a wimp player the captain of Toronto is. That's the type of player when Steven Stamkos jumped him, not, not jumped him, fought him and forced him to drop his gloves. Steven Stamkos manhandled him. And that's Steven Stamkos, not the biggest of players, or I think even smaller than, than Austin Matthews. So when I see a guy like Uri Slavkovsky who has no business fighting, having, having a pair of some things between his legs and having the courage to drop and fight and stand up to somebody and square off, you know what, Uri... Win or lose the fight, I couldn't care less. You're the type of player who's going to make the Montreal Canadiens a group of winners and not a group of losers who are fucking scared to go in the corners every single every single spring. So hats off to your 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 eye, great teammate, great work. Just please, for the love of God, be careful. We don't need you getting injured. See, but that's why I'm loving how this team is being built. Okay. You have a team like Toronto who are just a bunch of superstars getting high paid. And guess what? They don't go anywhere. Why? Because they have no chemistry. They're just a bunch of talented players on the ice getting so much money and don't know how to play with each other. They have no love and respect for each other. And that's why they don't lose. Uh, they don't win. Okay? The way this team is being built, I've said this so many times, and Marty you know, clarified that in this press conference that he's building a house, a home, not a house. He's building a home, a family, having that on the ice will take us a long way. You know how scary this team could be if it's not just one guy defending your players like Jack Eye. imagine everybody else dropping the gloves when it's time. I'm not saying we want, you know, Suzuki to drop or Cole Caulfield to drop the gloves and get injured or Sofkowski. Or I'm not asking for these guys to be fighters or enforcers. But they're all players who will drop when needed to defend their brothers. And that's a scary thing to have on your team. Because yep. let's go back, let's go back years ago when you know George Larac was a scary player. Okay. Yep. 
when he was on the ice, it was scary for the league. But when he was off the ice, who gives a shit? But now, when you have a team like Montreal, who everybody is scary, meaning you don't know when a player will drop, that's where the league is going to be scared. Because the league will not just wait for Jacket to come on the ice and say, oh, Jacket is on the bench. Let's, 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 let's have fun now. Oh, he's on. Let's be scared. No. They're going to be scared of everybody because if Afkoski yeah. can drop his gloves at any given time and Cole can drop his gloves at any given time, we're a fucking scary ass team. Well, and, and to that point, and really to that point, Anthony, if you think back to the most disgusting group, but one of the tightest groups that I've seen, the 2011 Boston Bruins, there go. when Johnny Boychuk beat the shit out of, like they beat the shit out of, and, and they fought Spacek, Hammerlake, Tom Pye got bloodied by uh, Gregory Campbell. Uh, like they just, and, and I'm going to go another step further. I love George Larock. George Larock, awesome. Remember, remember that time where he was literally following, chasing Milan Lucic on the ice. I, I just want to make a comparable. The difference, the difference is like George Larock had enough discipline and restraint not to jump Lucic. Jack I didn't. And that's even like again, that's even scary. But again, we're talking about team a team toughness overall. But again, Kirby Doc dropped the gloves in the recent games. Uri Slavkovsky dropped the gloves in recent games. Pizzetta and Jack I go, think it goes without saying they dropped the gloves in recent games. Uh, Jaden Strubel is showing signs of, uh, of a very tough, uh, tough player to play against. Uh, Logan Mayu is going to be another tough guy to play against. Luke Tuck up and coming. There's another Jack Eye brother. There's Florian coming up. Like this is going to be a scary freaking group to play against. And they're like, people are going to have to really stop thinking, like start thinking twice before again, they commit any acts of, of, I don't know any any questionable acts on the ice. Let's. Yeah. I was going to say another, but I'll, I'll keep it more PG. Yeah. So yeah, before we wrap it up, I just want to bring up one more thing. I think it's important to bring it up because um, he is important to this team and to the rebuild and to the future. And I know a lot of fans, <clears throat> Joey, uh, are 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 bitching about. Oh, why do we choose Ryan Becker? He's injury prone, and look at him. He's gone. Look, it sucks. It sucks. He's out for what four to six months, okay, or five to six months. Five, five to six months. Five yeah, to six months. Okay, it's pretty much the whole season. Uh, if we make playoffs, he might be back for that. Okay, but first off, I'm not you know taking out taking out value out of him, but he hasn't been an established player yet. Okay, so it doesn't hurt that much. Kind of sounds bad. I'm not saying I don't care about him or anything, but he's not an established player. We don't know what season he would have had. We haven't seen him play yet in the NHL. Okay. He is an amazing player. We've seen him play. He's great. And he's, you know, our future defenseman. I and mean, we picked him uh first overall last fifth, year. Fifth overall. Fifth overall. Yeah, fifth overall, first, uh, overall last year, year before yeah. Demi Dov. Okay. I get it. It sucks. It's just an, an an unfortunate situation that happened. But it doesn't mean that we chose wrong, Joey. Okay? It doesn't mean that it was just bad timing. He's gone. But it doesn't really affect this season. Right? Because, again, he wasn't an established player yet. We don't know if he would have fit the core. We don't know. We haven't seen it yet. Losing Liney, we know his history. We know his past. If we were to lose knock on wood, someone like Cole or Suzuki or Lane Hudson, yes, it's a big impact to the team because we've seen them, we know what they can they're capable of doing. They have a history. Reinbacker gone, it sucks. But just look at it as another year in the AHL, another year, you know, developing. I know it's not the same, but again, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean we chose wrong. And guess what? He might be ready if we make the playoffs. Yeah, so well said. So, so, so well said. Um, biggest, the biggest downfall here is just, or the biggest uh, problem in all of this is that he loses one year of development. Yeah. Okay, that, that sets him back. But fans, please, 
please, please, please. I, I know I'm, I don't even want to say the name, but Mishkov in Philly. There's a reason why six other te- uh, five other teams, including our, if we include ourselves, six teams. There's six teams that passed up on this player. He might be a superstar and a talent. He might be doing some pretty nice stuff in uh, in Philadelphia's training camp. There's a reason why Jeff uh, Gorton and Kent Hughes are making millions of dollars in a given year. I um, We also have a, a lovely, lovely professional scout and our amateur scout, um, our head of scouting pretty much called Nick Bobrov. I'm sorry, the, the, <laughs> Nick Bobrov, who had ties directly with Mishkov's teams, uh, team in Russia, and the Canadians passed up on him. I know that there's there's something, you know, again, I'm going to reiterate, he's doing some pretty crazy things. He's scoring multiple goals. He's looking pretty good. David Reinbacker's injury and temporary setback is no reason to start panicking, start throwing Kent and, and Jeff under the bus. Just patience. Reinbacker's going to come back. He's he's going to be a pillar on defense for many years to come, whether it be for the Montreal Canadiens or another team. He's going to be a great stay-at-home defenseman. He's going to be responsible. He's going to make those good passes. He was having a good camp. Unfortunate event. Just be patient. That's all. And, yes, it sucks that we have these injuries, especially two big names of our team. But it opens up an opportunity to see other players who are going to be sent down and now have a chance to play. And we can see them perform earlier. You know, we have space now for Joshua Roy to come up. We have more space for Mayu to play this year. You know, I know I'm not, I'm not saying that Liney is uh, injured is a blessing of disguise or anything. I'm not saying that whatsoever. But now we have a chance for the next two months to see another player who probably wouldn't have made it play right away and maybe he is a good fit for the team and will perform and you know when Liney comes back it might be hard to send down one of these guys because oh my god you know now we just saw them what they can do you know what I mean so there's a name already mentioned by Jeff Gorton sorry there's uh it's uh no I didn't hear what you uh, said sorry you could Oliver Kapanen Oliver Kapanen he's he like Jeff Gorton didn't even hesitate a split second and he said Oliver Kapanen is going to be that guy that's probably going to be able to stick around now because Line is not there. Mm-hmm. And I definitely think Oliver Kapanen, like, again, in no way, shape, or form are we going to celebrate any injury, but it might mean this guy sticking around and it might mean this guy playing for the team. It might mean buying time for, for Kent Hughes to make a move for Christian Dvorak, who hasn't had such a good camp. I mean, Oliver Kapanen has definitely justified, at, at, at the very least, Staying with uh, staying with the Montreal Canadiens, staying with the big club, and 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 starting the season here, and I think because of that injury, he's going to start the season. And and again, I'm not going to start comparing Oliver Kapanen to Patrick Laine, but there's a silver lining here. There is one of our arguably top ten prospects. I definitely think he climbed in the in the rankings since we did our show. Um, I had him at number nine overall. I I, I definitely think. He is on the top 10 list and he's inching his way up closer to, you know, number seven, possibly even number six with, uh, with what he's doing and he'll be here. And, and again, Oh, there's always Anthony. So well said, there's always a silver lining. There's always a positive outlook. And that positive outlook is going to be getting a little bit more time with one of our top prospects. Who's, who's probably going to stay here. And that also might translate into a trade uh, of another player, such as Christian Dvorak. And that's happens, uh, that's that. Everything happens for a reason. Look, Saturday, I said the season was over already. When's 2025, 2026 season starting? Is it now? Like, I was just furious, angry, and and like you said before, deflated. And it still sucks. It still burns. It still hurts. But let's look at the positive. You know, Patrick Liney was not the big difference here. We have a future that we're trying to build with all these young superstars. Liney was just a player to try to fix our power play and, 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 and fix the core of our team. Liney might not be here, might not even be here next year or in two years. You know what I mean? So we got to look at the positive of the other players that we have established and uh, the other players that are need to grow for this team. 
And you know what? Like I said before, maybe we're going to have a good two months with these players, and then Liney comes in to spark it up even more. That's also a good sign. This was the best news us Has fans could have heard with the situation that happened on Saturday. We all thought his season was over. We all thought it was maybe a potential career-ending injury. This guy just got a sprain, and he's gone for two to three months. I'm excited. I'm very excited. And Num What? Number one, Christmas is going to come early this year with Patrick Line coming back. There you go. Let's look at it that way. The, and the other, uh, again, I, I don't want to drag it back into this conversation, but I just, with what you said, there's something that just hit me so hard. The way that the team has responded to what happened, in particular, Arbor Jack Eye, if I'm Patrick Line and I played one game, and four and a half minutes, one game and four and a half minutes of a sec of a second game. And my team is willing, my teammate is willing to lay down the hammer and get a fine and whatever to, to again, avenge me and, and my, my injury. Did you see? Did, did did you see Patrick Liney smile? Like he, ha there was a picture of him outside of a uh, uh, what looked like a private jet on crutches, and he's smiling and he says, "I'll like basically, I'll be back." Like I'll be he showed up to practice yeah. with crutches. Like he didn't have to be there. The guy's yeah, excited that, to play. He has a, that's it. a brotherhood that's ready to fight for him. He's gonna fucking find a way to come back in two months and not three. Okay? I think so too. That's what you're saying is resonating so much with me because even like he should be so pissed off and so like he could have done two things. He could have been completely demoralized and been like, why me? How did this happen? Oh, like get down, completely get down on himself. I'm just seeing pictures of, like we said, pictures of him at, or images and videos of him at practice, smiling, interacting with the team there. Uh, again, the picture outside of the, the jet smiling, like I'm looking at him and I'm going, what do you have to smile about, man? Like I'm looking at him and I'm saying, why are you smiling? And so, yeah, I think this guy's going to be, I think he's going to be locked in when he comes in. And unfortunately, well, there goes, there goes our predictions out the window. Who's going to score more goals, but Patrick Liney, like I said, I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be coming in. He's going to be a little rough coming in. Obviously, he's going to have to adapt, and and we'll see how the knee is feeling and and all that. But give him give him a few games. Let uh, let the gears uh, the rust get off the gears. And oh man, oh man. Oh, with that said, Anthony, how how are you feeling after this hour and twelve minutes we've been talking? How how are you feeling now? I was furious and deflated the last couple of days, but I think I'm just now getting excited again. I know it's this back and forth Habs fan reaction of like one day you're fucking angry and the other day you're excited and one moment you want the season to already end and now you want to you're excited. We both said at the beginning of this episode how excited we were and then we lost it. So now an hour and 13 minutes later after talking to you and just speaking about our beloved Habs and brotherhood that they're building, I'm fucking excited. Okay, we have one more uh, preseason game this Saturday. And then we had the fucking season starting, and I can't wait for that first puck drop. That's it. Oh, yeah. That being yeah. said. Well, I was just going to say last thing before you wrap up the end episode. Very important. And I think we should even include this in our Instagram clip as, a, uh, as, uh, as an advertisement for the episode. PSA to Montreal Canadiens fans. Do yourself a favor and stay far away from any Maple Leafs fans' comments, uh, Ottawa Senators fans' comments. You will go down a very dark rabbit hole into a world of individuals who are complete homers and do not understand the game of hockey. So again, PSA, steer clear of any Leafs fans' comments and Ottawa Senators fans' comments for your own well-being. We love you and, and we really want you to take care. Amazing. That being said, guys, let's wrap this up. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the episode, the season's coming up. We have amazing news coming up where the curfew boys are going back to their roots. We will be recording post-game shows again, and we want the fans to be involved in this. So stay tuned for more details on that. If you love what you hear, 
please give us an honest rating. We would love to hear what you think. And if you want to hear our shows, you can listen to us on any any podcast platform like Apple, Spotify, or Google, or any other podcast platform you like to listen to. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. And if you want to see our beautiful faces, you can subscribe on our YouTube channel. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, love you. Bye now. Bye now. Good night.